Welcome audience to the latest episode of the Talk in Dean podcast. I'm your host Majid and today I have my usual uh, co-host brother Rash. Assalamu alaikum. And also we have uh, return the return of our history enthusiast brother Ishti. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum brothers. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah good. Alhamdulillah. How things been? Busy. Busy. Yeah. <laughs> so we haven't brother, seen him for a while. <laughs> we've not seen Brother Ishti for a while because uh, the brother got married. Uh, I pray that inshallah Allah keeps your marriage uh, secure and Ameen. Uh, on the deen. Ameen. So, uh, so you know, many people talk about, I don't know, it's like a joke, like people get married and then they disappear. <laughs> but in your case, bro, I've seen that actually happen. <laughs> you know, alhamdulillah, the sunnah of marriage is a blessing. Sometimes you have to enjoy the blessings. Of oh, mashallah, <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Okay, subhanallah. Right. Let's get on to the topic, guys. Inshallah. Uh, and today, uh, the topic is a very important one, brothers and sisters. Now, most of you may already know about what's going on in Palestine in regards to the deal of the century. We know that, uh, you know, a while back, uh, America recognized uh, Jerusalem as being the capital of Israel. And also, uh, they recognized that the Golan Heights was part of Israel. And we know that uh, not long ago, uh, Trump and his son-in-law uh, Jared Kushner they announced their deal of the century but what this podcast is going to concentrate on isn't the deal of the century because what I was thinking is that you know when the deal of the century was announced and, and the moves that have been carried out in those lands recently you know when you look at the reaction of the Muslim world I was thinking subhanAllah if Muslims really understood what Al-Quds means, what Al-Aqsa means to, in, to Islam, to Muslims. How can it be that the reaction is as low as it is? How come there isn't the uproar that this place deserves, i.e. Al-Quds? So what we want to do today is we want to discuss the issue, the issue of Al-Quds. We want to discuss what does Al-Quds mean to Muslims? What does it mean in Islam? And inshallah ta'ala, we hope that when we deliver this podcast, it will be delivered in a way that parents can sit down with their children and explain to them and show to them this podcast so that we have an awareness within the ummah, certainly the next generation, on what Al-Qud means. Okay? So brothers, my first question to you guys is, I think it's important to maybe explain mm. the terms of Al-Quds, Al-Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis, because a lot of times we may think that people are aware of what these terms mean. What do you guys think? Okay. Yeah, no, no, really important because I think, and I'll speak about myself as well, there was, I had to do reading, you know, not so long ago, and maybe even more recently as well, about there are a lot of terms that are, are thrown around, and you assume that they are all linked to the land of Palestine, and they are. So you naturally, as long as you have an appreciation for the importance of it, you just you go, okay, it means that. But really, a lot of people don't know. And to be fair, just going quickly back to your point at the beginning is, even during my khutbah on Friday, I did ask the question um, of how many of you know about the deal of the century? What did okay. say? And so obviously I was just looking to see people's reaction to it. And a fair few people nodded their head while I was giving the khutbah. But a few people immediately was like, what is this deal of the century? You could see from their reaction. So I was just trying to gauge a reaction during the khutbah to see how many people you know, really have heard of it. And again, my khutbah was again on this topic because rather than the deal of the century. Because the reason for pressing that button is just to see if we don't know about the deal of the century it may be because we are not looking at is what is happening in the muslim lands and especially it's not just muslim land which is hopefully what we'll speak about today so i think like you said the first thing we should do is speak about some of these terms and i'll start one off rather than me mentioning them all i will say that so when people say al-quds they are talking about jerusalem because al-quds itself means the holy or the holy one so people refer it to as Jerusalem, and like you said, it's being now saying that this is the capital of Israel, but Al-Quds is talking about Jerusalem. This is holy land in itself. So I'll start off with that one, really, rather than okay. reeling all of them off. And I'll explain the one of Al-Aqsa, because this is the one mm. where, subhanAllah, over the times, um, you know, I remember we had the issue where 
in most Muslim houses, you had a picture of the dome or the rock. Yeah. Mm. And people thought this was Al-Aqsa. Even now, don't you? You see mm. all these videos that people make. If you ever see, whether you go on TRT World or anybody who makes a video of Al-Aqsa and what is happening, you always see the Dome of the Rock. So the Dome of the Rock is the one which is the one with the gold yes. top, isn't it? So, but, but the thing is, is originally I thought there was a conspiracy theory, <laughs> what, which was that Al-Aqsa Masjid, okay, what is the mosque, the building that's across the Dome of the Rock. Mm. But still, actually, if somebody was to show the picture of the Dome of the Rock and say this is Al-Aqsa, this is not entirely incorrect. Mm. Because I would say originally, I would say that, no, that's not Al-Aqsa Masjid, or that's not Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is the mosque that's in front of it. But in reality, Al-Aqsa is the whole land yeah. where the complex, what they call the Temple Mount. Temple Mount, right? yeah. All that land is Al-Aqsa. So even if those two buildings, well, I, I'm sure Ishi, our historian, will touch upon this, but even if those two buildings weren't there, mm. it would still be Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa is still Al-Aqsa, Al-Aqsa because yeah. it's that land, yeah? So Al-Aqsa is the land that when you see a, a bird's eye view of this, you see the mosque and you see the Dome of the Rock. Yeah. You see all of the gates around the outside. Yes. You see the Dome of the Rock, which is with the gold top. You see the other Qibla Mosque. Kibli Mosque, which mm. is the grey top, yes. you see this tiny little version of the of the other mosque next to the Dome of the Rock. There's a, li- a little version with a little top. Okay. You see that? So there's quite a few, and then you see what what is the 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 Wailing Wall, as they call mm. it. The, yeah. So all of that actually yeah. all sits atop Al Aqsa. Al Aqsa. So yeah. Ishi, what's Beit al Maqdis? Beit al Maqdis. Just as a side note, okay. that Temple Mount was what they say Suleiman Ali Salam yeah. built. Yeah. So it's uh, the when he was, yeah, um, during his time he built yeah. that, and that is cl- classed as a blessed place. Masjid Al Aqsa, or Masjid Al Aqsa, <laughs> is <laughs> it basically it's the masjid from where the Prophet Sallallahu during his uh, night journey, Al Isra and Wal Miraj, when he travelled up to the heavens, uh, he he went and ascended to the heavens, but he led the prophets in prayer. So it's the masjid that. Not often shown, it has a kind of greenish appearance, grey greenish appearance, and is as you said, not often shown. Um, and as it is mentioned in the Quran, its blessings are uh, sorry, its surroundings are blessed as well. So, yeah, it's an actual masjid from where the Prophet uh, ascended to the heavens. And Bayt al Maqdis, Bayt al Maqdis, so Bayt al Maqdis is it's just a term that means house of the holiness, house of holiness. Yeah, so actually, Bayt al Maqdis is also that area. So some people say Al-Aqsa. Yep. You've heard lots of the Al-Aqsa compound, Beit al Temple Mount. They're all referring to that area and that area exists within Jerusalem. Subhanallah. Yeah? I forgot to mention it's, it's yeah. uh, translated as the furthest mosque. Yes, that's Beit right. al-Maqdis. Yeah. Okay, mashallah. So if you think about Al-Aqsa. it... Al-Aqsa. Al-Aqsa, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what you meant. Yeah. Al-Aqsa. Okay. My point, I was still talking about my point. Okay, no problem. So if you think about it, when you see uh, the... Israeli troops, the occupying troops that are on that are on the Temple Mount, or as they would call it, mm. basically, is it doesn't really matter whether they go inside the Masjid or not. They are on Al Aqsa, aren't they? They are on mm. Al Aqsa when they are there, and this is something which is prohibited for them to be right. You know, I, I'll I'll give you an example, right? Yep. Say you're in the Haram, right, and you saw a non-Muslim there. How would you feel? Not necessarily in the Kaaba, just yeah. in the, on in the yeah, enclosed yeah, exactly, area. Exactly, you should have yeah. the exact same feeling because it is yeah. the exact same thing. Okay, well let's 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 move on to that. I think, alhamdulillah, I think hopefully uh, for our listeners uh, and viewers, we've explained some key things of Al Aqsa, uh, Beit Al Maqdis, um, Al Quds. Yeah. So that leads on to the the next question, which is Al Quds, and when we talk about Al Quds, remember we we're talking about Jerusalem. Mm. Okay, so Al Quds is the the holy one, the whole, like as Rash explained, the holy area, and within Al Quds we have the the mosques. Okay, the mosque, shall I say, right? So the question is, is that what does Al Quds mean to Muslims? What status does Al Quds have in Islam? I'm going to start this off by asking a question that Abu Dar asked the Prophet sallallahu and he asked, "O Messenger of Allah, which masjid was built first on earth?" And the Prophet ﷺ replied, the sacred masjid of Makkah, i.e. the Haram, you know, the Kaaba, as we all know. 
uh, Abu Dar radiallahu anhu then decided to ask what was the second mosque built, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Masjid al Aqsa. So Abu Dar naturally asked the question. So what was the period in between the two mosques? Because we all know that this, the Kaaba was the first mosque built on earth. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, 40 years. So 40 years after the Kaaba was built, Masjid al-Aqsa was built. So just to confirm, or to clarify, shall I say, is who is it true that Ibrahim al-Islam built the, uh, the Kaaba? Or when you're talking about the first instance, who built the Kaaba? Or the, the masjid? I think this is a bit of a scholarly debate. Right. Okay. And there are some scholars who say Ibrahim a.s. built it. Yes. And it's also verified that Ibrahim a.s. he resided in Palestine. Yes. The land of Palestine. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in fact, there's a city named after him, Al Khalil, Hebron. Hebron, yes, yes. Yeah. So, but there's some that say it started at the time of Adam a.s. Okay. And it was him who built it. Him a.s. And there might be, the confusion might be when people say Qibla. You know, it's not it's not about the the mosque, the qibla itself being built by Adam alayhi salam. It's the idea that that was the place, the first place of tawhid, the first place of worship, was where the qibla is now, or in we, terms of a location. Or do we see it in a different way? Do like you, I think that's a fantastic point there, Rash. You're not talking about the physical building. No, exactly. But what we're saying is that these these land, this land yeah. was holy then. Exactly. So it starts off as being the Adam alayhi salam built the first. As you class it as when we say mosque, we're not talking about what looks like a mosque now with a minaret and a top. We're talking about a place of worship. So the first place of worshiping Tawheed, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Adam alayhi salam was where Makkah is now. And then the second place, as you said, 40 years later was in where Al-Aqsa is now. Interesting enough, and this is a very minor point. There are hadith that I've read a while ago that say that, you know, Hud alayhi salam was before Ibrahim alayhi salam. He used to visit the land of the Kaaba. So those places are holy by definition. It's yeah. not the building that makes them, it's the land. land. Yeah. So basically what you're saying is that the, that land, this land we're talking about, uh, has been blessed, has been holy from a very long time ago. We call them Ard al-Mubarak. The, the land itself is uh, blessed. A b- way, way before, yeah. for example, the revelation of the Quran. Yeah. Okay, subhanAllah. So in regards to... Um, Islam then, in regards to the, the, the final message uh, in the, the wahi that you mentioned before, I mean the revelation, what does uh, the Quran tell us? Obviously, Quran tells us we take our we take the information about Bayt al-Maqdis, about this area from the Quran and Sunnah anyway. Okay? So what we do know, like you're saying, is that that land, Allah has blessed this land way back. And, and from what I know, is certainly the, the land of uh, uh, Palestine, the land of Al-Quds. This is where many, many... Prophets resided. Yeah, there were many mm-hmm. prophets that lived in this land, this blessed land. Yeah. Uh, so, what does uh, the Quran uh, tell us specifically then uh, about this land? I think it's worth mentioning this yeah. because, you know, to, uh, we say the stories in the Quran. Well, it's actually histories of the prophets. It's not yeah. stories. Yes. Because they happened, and they, we take lessons from them, uh, and there are many of them. And for, from the time of Ibrahim al-Islam, who's the, uh, as I understand, the first prophet in uh, Palestine. He built uh, the Kaaba, obviously in Mecca. Uh, there's been many and many generations of prophets who followed him. So this has been a place of revelation. Many a revelation has come there, from uh, Yaqub al-Islam to uh, Yusuf al-Islam, Dawud al-Islam, Dawud al-Islam famously Suleiman al-Islam. He they built the Temple Mount, Subhanallah. Isa al-Islam, mm. and finally. It was passed on to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Th- so this is how we should see it. This is not just a normal land. This has been blessed by the presence of numerous prophets. And I think something which I think we'll, we will come to later, but just to maybe mention at this point is the fact that people shouldn't get confused. And when you're mentioning like, just say Sulaiman al-Islam, we're mentioning some of the prophets which, uh, you know, uh, just say the the Jewish people try to... Uh, so uh, have a monopoly over uh, or Isa al-Islam Christians so here we're talking about all the all the Anbiya they were all Muslim yeah, all the Anbiya were Muslim so this land was blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not, not to a particular particular uh, prophet it's blessed for in, in effect mm. the world for mankind right what does Allah say they say they, the Christians say that Ibrahim al-Islam was a uh, Christian and the Jews say that uh, Ibrahim al-Islam is Jewish but Ibrahim al-Islam is one who submit to Allah subhanahu wa yeah, ta'ala. Muslim, yeah. And he and that's how we see every one of the Anbiya, the Prophets. They submit to the, to the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right manner. Um, as a side note about Sulaiman al-Islam, you mentioned Qibli Masjid. 
there's a story. You know, Suleiman Islam was given command, absolute command over man, jinn, birds, etc. Mm. And there's a story that when <laughs> Suleiman Islam passed away, that the jinns were being driven so hard, right, that they didn't realize he'd passed away. And there's a position known where he passed away. And there's, there's part of that Masjid Ghibli. If you look under the uh, Aqsa compound, you can still see the stone columns and the arches, and there's a bit of history about it. So, so you know, there, there's a bit of our little history tied into these places that not many people know. I just like, like that as a bit of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, subhanAllah. Because obviously, you, you hear the story about uh, that uh, Suleiman al Islam was resting mm. on his uh, staff. Yeah, and the staff and drops. The ant, ant, I think ant yeah. ate at it. Mm. And, uh, but that's why also I remember someone else mentioning the fact that even within the Al Aqsa compound, there's many, many other mosques. Yes. And I think you're on about these because we always think mm. there's just one or there and there's yeah. the Dome of the Rock. But okay, so uh, in regards to uh, the Isra Miraj, you know, maybe we should shed some light. On this because now this is something which is directly happening in the life of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam the final messenger before we yes there's a very important point i'll, I'll uh, let, let you just come in, in a moment you know yeah so they, they, went, they went through a really difficult time so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to honor the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam due Allah. to this new uh, journey isra wal miraj isra is the part where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went to uh, jerusalem to to pray and Miraj is the ascension to the heaven. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the ayat in Surah Isra. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Subhanallah asra bi adihi laylam min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa allati barakna hawlahu li nurihi min ayatina inna hu huwa as al basir. Exalted is he who took his servant, i.e., the Prophet by night from Masjid al Haram to the Masjid al Aqsa. So here both. The Kaaba is mentioned and Masjid al-Aqsa, but the interesting bit, whose surroundings, so Al-Aqsa and the surroundings are blessed. So Allah is saying the land is blessed, clearly, to show him one of our signs. Indeed, he is the hearing and the seeing. And this is the first time that connection is made to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, and that's the first time the connection to the Muslim between this land is cemented through revelation. And we know that uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he led the uh, Anbiya in Salah on that blessed land, like on the on the Isra part. Yeah, so a point I'd like to make is, you know, sometimes as Muslims, what we do is we, you know, we have the the prevalent society has affected us. So some people say this place is, is important because it's strategic. This place is important because it's Muslim land. Mm. You know, this place is important for, for various reasons now, the material reasons. But this is where I think, like you say, the ayat that you gave, it, that should give it significance. The land is blessed. This is where the mirage, to, you know, it started from. But equally, like we, we could ask if Allah what simply wanted to take the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam up to the heavens to give him the salah that we know that that was when the obligation of salah, the five daily salah was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it's one of the obligations that were given not on this earth. You know, all the other obligations that we've been given, it came, came by a revelation True. to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whilst on earth. And salah is so important that it was given on that night. But it could have just taken him up. It didn't have to take him all the way to the blessed lands. Even Makkah is, is blessed. Even Makkah is blessed. So he chose to take him to Al-Aqsa. MashaAllah. Highlighting the significance of taking him to Al-Aqsa like you said, leading the Salah in, in, in front of all of the an Anbiya. You know, thousands and thousands of prophets. And then choosing to take him up to the heavens. So that alone should highlight the significance of this land. You know, if yeah. anything happened to Makkah now, if Makkah was occupied, how much would that agitate us? So why isn't it that now... Al-Aqsa is occupied, Jerusalem is, Jerusalem is occupied, Palestine is occupied. Why isn't it having that same agitation? And of course, for some people it is. I'm not, it's not a blanket, you know, criticism, but it's, it's a criticism to ourselves that we should appreciate just how important this land is. And it's not because of, you know, just because it's Muslim land, it's because it's blessed land, like Allah says in, in the Quran. You know, it, it, there's another aspect to this, right? And it, you reminded me of that, um, of Surah Deen, because, you know, there's a very important significance of that journey. 
and you say you make a really interesting point that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk, had this pit stop the mm. greatest pit stop of all time right subhanallah right you know at the, the, what, why I mentioned surah teen wa teen wa zaitun wa turi sinin wa hada al balad al amin by the fi, uh, by the fig and by the olive mm-hmm. yeah so these are said to be the signs of nuh al-islam and sorry adam al-islam and nuh al-islam what what turi sinin that's a symbol of where musa al-islam refer, uh, received the revelation and wa hada al balad al amin ai makkah there's a like a journey through the prophethood so you know we say there's a sharia of dawood al-islam isa al-islam that they all carried on and this is and this is where it ended in makkah and why he led those prophets in prayer was to show that now he's taken the mantle of that leadership of prophethood it's his sharia mm. and he's leading them to show that significance so we got to make that clear in people's head this is a very important time in islam that this is where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took that mantle this is that yes. very night in this very mosque nowhere else and as you say it's a very important place mm. for that reason and also if you think about it when the when subhanallah when the muslims and we were going to touch upon this but when they did uh, conquer uh, palestine liberate. liberated it uh, you know the significance that when they were when they went to what they would have known as the 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 al the al-aqsa compound yeah, or at that time land, the temple yeah. mount they would mm. call it is the narrations are that they were they they were crying and especially when bilal radiyallahu anhu when he made the adhan because this because he reminded them of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he had passed away yeah. but they remind them that he was here mm. he led the anbiya in salah on this place and it was just for them it was subhanallah it was amazing so you know i think in regards to the significance well the sharash you know, point like say even what we've said now should highlight how important it is but there is more There's quite a few more things. Let me just very quickly mention some of the other things. Yeah, go for it. Because first of all, we know there's reward attached to praying in Masjid Al-Aqsa, which is more than any other mosque other than Masjid Al-Haram and Masjid Al-Nabawi. Yeah. yeah? So Makkah, Medina, and the third place where you are you are given extra reward to pray Salah in is Masjid Al-Aqsa. So I've heard different... Um, kind of hadiths one that says 250 times mm. and another one that says 500 times more reward to pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa than any other mosque that's one aspect that's the reward aspect mm. then the other aspect is even to travel to a masjid as an intention to say I'm going to visit a masjid for the for the masjid itself there's only three that you're allowed to travel to and again that is those three masjids so the fact that masjid al aqsa is included in them all of these times those are important there's also another well, just, hadith just on that point Sorry, just to just say, yeah, say yeah. to you is you mentioned three mosques mm. you know in the quran only two mosques are, are mentioned, mentioned. yeah uh, oh, masjid wow. al haram and, and masjid, masjid al aqsa exactly masjid nabawi is not mentioned even though it's second in that list of reward aspect you're saying but if 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 that if that mosque came under occupation how would we react even though we know that you know that mosque is not even mentioned in the quran but here you're talking about you specifically talking about the a mosque that is mentioned in the quran yeah so that in itself should be a significance for us i think there's also a hadith that mentions that if you want all of your sins to be forgiven start your pilgrimage at masjid al aqsa subhanallah start there and then go to uh, masjid al haram and then do your for pilgrimage hajj. for hajj yeah if you do that pilgrimage it's like a, an extra level Yeah so there's there's those aspects then there's also the aspect that some people are aware of I'm sure or many people are aware of is that the qibla the direction of salah was for the muslims initially was to pray towards masjid al aqsa put it this way so again during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam initially that all of the muslims would be facing masjid al aqsa to pray and that lasted for several months nearly a year, what was it nearly a year and a half months or 16, 16 months. months so and that was during in just makkah just to confirm even though they were in makkah even mm-hmm. though they were in makkah they weren't praying towards the qibla i to the kaaba towards yeah. the kaaba sorry yeah of course qibla is both um, <laughs> th- even then not praying towards the kaaba yeah. so sometimes and i'm sure like say a lot of people know this but when i speak to my children about it they're surprised oh everybody pay, prays towards the kaaba how is it that there was a time when we didn't pray towards the kaaba so the fact we, that was our qibla masjid al aqsa was the direction we prayed until it was changed and i remember there's the mosque of qiblatain you know in in medina which is the mosque which has the two qiblas mm. it has one direction because that was the mosque that the sahaba was in when the direction changed 
So they actually have two qiblas kibl- That's the mosque there. where when you pray uh, two rakah nafil, it's the same as no. Umrah reward. No, that's, that's the masjid, the Quba. Yeah. But anybody who goes yeah. on Hajj or just Umrah or just goes there to visit, they should, yeah. those two mosques in Medina, they have significance. Mm. Like say, Masjid Quba has significance because that was like the resting place. That was the first mosque that was built there by the Prophet Sallallahu on his journey to Medina. So that has significance. And yes, the reward of an Umrah. You know, just, just a side comment yeah, yeah. is that, I'm sure, I can't remember, I'm sure it was India, yeah. where they found this mosque, I shared it ages ago, they found this mosque and they, like, it was like, uh, you know, they did excavation, they came across it, and there was a member there. And that mm. member was facing uh, Aqsa. Al-Aqsa. Ah, so, Allah, okay. Allah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. How, that, how that was the case, but that was quite interesting. But so, yeah, so, uh, so, so, no, no, those, those are really other things. And, you know, just to add, there's, there's more as well, to be fair. So, there's so, more. So, what if I said, what if yeah. I asked you, is the issue of Al-Quds, for Muslims, is it an Aqidah matter? Is it something which is like a, a part of our, of our Iman? See, that's the point. When we mention the revelation, what happens? That automatically becomes part of our identity. You know, we say Aqidah and we say Iman, right? I've started to using this term identity because that's who we are. That's part of our personality. When Allah says it's blessed, I say it's blessed. Mm. <laughs> you should, it's, it's, it's as simple as that, isn't it? Yes. I'm not going to go with any, uh, you can't go any simpler than that. Allah has said that's blessed, mm. right? And there's a further point that I want to start making about the history of the Prophet Sallallahu Because you know, you know, as the, the, the land uh, was becoming more stable, the Prophet Sallallahu right, the Romans, they knew there were Arabs, right, in, in Arabia, funnily enough. <laughs> but they didn't care. They were like, oh, what am I going to go, go to Arabia for? They're just sort of like, they fight amongst each other and that's it. But you know the Prophet Sallallahu and you know the Arabs at the, before, they wouldn't imagine going against the Arabs. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam started going because he had the idea of that land. He sent Muta, the, uh, the Battle of uh, Muta, he sent the Battle of Tabuk. So it was already in the hearts. That's where the connection was made. And the uh, Battle of uh, Osama bin Zayd, like, he ready the army to go out, but unfortunately he passed the away. Army, the army of Osama. Yeah. And you could see that connection that they wanted that land. They wanted to be a part of that land. And these, ra- these battles were very close to that land. Okay, so... The point let, let, so, so no, no, but I, because what I'm thinking is is that uh, is the next question I want to ask anyway, so you can continue is the fact that um, in regards to uh, the conquests, how was then um, Al Quds brought into the under the fold of uh, the Islamic rule? And I think the part the part of the point I was making earlier was that it was already in the heart that we want this land because it's mm. part of our identity. Okay. That's the point, and actually, That's it's funny, you're making, okay, and it's funny. actually really important uh, that that we bring that up because Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala an. Now, there's a, there's a story that uh, the Prophet ready the army and he camped them out in a place. Uh, I forgot the name is. I think it might be a Jurf or something like that. Um, and he'd ready them, and unfortunately, the Prophet passed from from this earth and. The army came back, obviously there's sadness and you know the Prophet said that's the most difficult thing that the Ummah is going to face. He's passing away. Right after Abu Bakr told the army to go back three days later and he sent it off to follow in the footstep of his father, i.e. back in that land. Anyway, a time later, Shur Habil ibn Hassan came to the Prophet, uh, sorry, Abu Bakr and said, have you been thinking about Palestine? And Abu Bakr said, actually, fully enough, I have. And they decided to do shura, and he raised this issue. And Umar said, I've been thinking about it as well. So you can see the Sahaba, they see it as part of them. Even though they haven't stabilized, they're entrenched in the Persian lands. They want it because they see it as part of them, their identity, who they are and what Islam is about. Subhanallah. And they ready the plans. Subhanallah. And they discuss how they're going to take, take this land. And they, had a pl- uh, they, they sort of built up a plan, decide to go ahead and take this land. They ended up with you know famous battles like Yarmouk. Yeah. You know, mo- a quick point for me about that is that this is why it's linked to your question, but it's also related to the fact that you're saying the um, why the why it's linked to Aqidah as well. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about this land, he talks about this being under the dominion of the believers. And when it says being under the dominion of the believers and implementing the deen of Allah, that means, you know, as we might go into some of the t- political bits later on, even today, if a, la- if a country who completely does not 
and you know implement the Sharia of Allah decides that all of a sudden they're going to take that land. That that dominion over that land is for those people who implement Allah's Deen. It's not just for anybody. And I think that's where it's part of our aqidah is to say that, like you said, is it comes from the Quran. It, Allah is telling us about this land and therefore we have to embrace that. And the Sahaba, like you said there, they already had that um, love for that land that they wanted to go and, and liberate it and bring it under Islam. To the extent that when we talk, say, about Salahuddin al Ayyubi later as well, that what, they had choices. They actually had choices as to which land to take ne- next and Always, when the choice be, um, was between anywhere and Palestine, that was always the, the choice. So that also highlights just how important, you know, historic people in our in, in Islam always, you know, highlighted that at such a high level. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, it's a fantastic point that you guys make. And also, you know, we know that the, the companions, the Sahaba, uh, they loved the Messenger wasallam so much that, you know, when he was making wudu, they would try to grab the, the water and stuff like that. And, and they knew the importance uh, mm. of this land. But on top of that also is they knew that their messenger they loved so much led the Anbiya in Salah. And you know what? I've never thought about, never ever thought about that point that you made about the pit stop. Obviously, mm. the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something that we know. So mm. unless there's definite evidence, that's the reason why. But, you know, if you think about it, the significance, the fact mm. that, you know, it could have just been one way to the to the to Jannah and back, but it went there. And really, if you think about it, to the Arabs of Mecca, mm. what significance? If mm. anything, what, what significance was that place? To yeah. be fair, you could look at it the other way. So the significance, could, you know, some people questioned it. They immediately questioned. So maybe the the fact they questioned that how could you have got in one night all the way to Palestine and. Just to go up and get the revelation, they might not have questioned that because he was mm-hmm. getting revelation anyway. So the fact that he mentioned that he went there and he later on was able to describe the place, which gave, you know, there was a lot of people who said, oh, look, you know, when they came to Abu Bakr famously and said, look, your, the messenger is saying that he, in one night he managed to go all the way to Al-Aqsa and back again. You know, people are going to call him crazy, quickly go and tell him to stop saying, saying this. Mm-hmm. You know, if that didn't happen, for some people, that might have been easier to believe, you know, especially like the hypocrites and people like that. But it happened and it has that link and it's, yeah. it just highlights its importance even more. So, you know, in regards to the, the, the conquest of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, of Al-Quds, you know, the famous story, the fact that the Muslims set siege mm. and the, um, uh, the patriarch of, uh, of so what was the name of the, uh, of what did the, what did the Romans call it? Alia was it? Alia, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the patriarch of this this area, this he area. decided to uh, basically give up the city, um, and they had known about the uh, uh, the character of uh, Umar ibn al Khattab, mm. who was the Khalifa at that time. So they requested that uh, he comes and uh, you know accepts the the keys himself. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna make a slight point, right? Um, I listen to a lot of history, mm. war history, right? And sometimes, like, you know, some people listen to music, whatever. I listen to history, <laughs> right? And, you know, it was funny. I was listening to a, a general, a modern-day general, talk about the history. And he says, when I think about the Muslim conquest, because he was doing it, you know, age mm. by age, and he was talking about the Romans, etc. He goes, I have no explanation. And I'll give you an example why I make, make this point. So, you know, when we go out for a journey, we prepare, we put boots, whatever. If you're going to climb a mountain, you might have a different uh, shoe than this, that, the other. You know what? The, you know what happened when they went to Jerusalem? They came in sandals, poorly equipped. They didn't even have siege 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 warfare. Mm. They didn't have anything set to siege that city. All they knew is that they wanted that land, and it was Allah's land. So they decided to go out. And what they used to do was they used to go or circle the the town. And make sure there wasn't supplies. Mm. You know, the Byzantines thought, you know what? Look at the state of these guys. They don't even have siege craft. They can't have got nothing to take the walls. They've got nothing to even survive the winter. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, them, made that happen. And they decided with their sort of perseverance to, to not allow any... Uh, they basically starved the city. And the mm-hmm. Romans couldn't handle it anymore. Yeah. Um, so I think that when we look at these people, you can actually see that that's how serious the matter was. Uh, when we talk about the patri- patriarch or patronarch, is it? Patriarch. Patriarch. Um, I don't know. Sofr- Sofrinius. Sof- Sofrinius. So that's how you pronounce Basically, it. he realized the status of this city 
to the Muslims. You could see these people, they're coming in this state, but he didn't want, but Amr ibn al-As was the commander, not the overall commander, that's Abu Ubaidah. He was a commander the outside. He said to him, I want someone of a higher rank. You, and he described him and he, he goes, oh, you want our leader, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And they, they called for him and he, deci- you know, he decided to take the journey and take the keys from these people. I don't know if you want to mention the, the story because it's a beautiful yeah, no, no, it, it is well worth mentioning the story. And you, you can get lots of really good versions of this on YouTube and things where it's telling you about the journey. Because I think originally when he did Shura to decide whether to go, there was an element of concern because normally a leader wouldn't leave you know, his, his place of protection to another land like this in case it was a trap of some sort. But he chose to go and he actually chose to take just one servant with him and, and one, was it uh, just a, one horse or a donkey. one a, donkey? A camel. Camel. Oh, okay. Get it. Camel? It's camel. Okay. okay. I've heard a couple of different... It, it was an animal. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Definitely animal. Yeah. So they chose to just take the one servant and, and actually make this journey, which is, subhanAllah, especially nowadays, in today's day and time, when you've got these leaders that, you know, take these huge entourages and stuff like that. But anyway, he, he, they decided to go. And they were even, if you, if you've, everybody who's heard the story, they took turns to ride, ride the animal yeah. and you know one would um, pull whilst the other you know the, he basically had the agreement at the beginning 50 50 we take it in turns and i think there was a bit of an issue when it got to the end and nearly at the gates the there was quite a few things that i'd seen mentioned previously is that they put like a, a big red carpet out for him as well and they sent clothes for him to wear and also they you know they really went out of their way to welcome Umar bin al-Khattab. So when he arrived, having actually slipped and got some mud on his clothes as well, and he was actually pulling at the time rather than being sat on on the animal. Um, he had 14 holes in his uh, toe yeah, as well. Yeah, so, and I think that was so like patched. Yeah, Even patched. his clothes were had like patchwork on it. So I think, was it Umar bin al-As who went to Abu meet Abayda, him? Abu Abayda. Abu Abayda went to meet him. Yeah, they went to um, speak to him and said, look, you know, you might, you, this is a bit humiliating. These guys are all prepared to receive you. And, you know, you don't look like a, a leader. And then that's when the, the famous saying comes. Uh, and I'll, I will, I'll say it rather than, I'll read it he rather than. He actually punched Abu Ubaidah. Not like punched him, punched him, just held him in position. Uh, and, you know, it was a really serious matter. Have you managed to find it or it's here? Sorry. Just say it, whoever's... We are people who are honoured through Islam. If we seek honour in any other way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will dishonour us. So, Umar remembers that before Islam, they were cobbling over, or like having arguments over, this camel who came here, this, that, the other. Mm. But it's Islam that brought them to this position. And if he chooses anything, even to appease the people that have come out for him, that's away from what he came from. And he understood his position. Not to say Abu Ubaidah didn't realize that, but sometimes you get caught up in the moment. Okay. And Abu Ubaidah realized the situation. No, no, this is it. And, and we, should, we should take lessons from that today. It's incredible. That's part of the issue that we have today is that maybe we look at leaders and things and we expect them to be like the, lead, you know, the leaders of today, which are just complete. But it's know, that memory mm, that it's Islam. Yeah. It's Islam that, that honors us. us. Honor. Nothing else honors us. Mm. If you did, if you take one step towards the dunya, you will eventually be dishonored, mm. whether in this life or the next. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you go towards Islam, whatever happens, mm. even if you do the wrong thing, you'll get reward for trying. Yeah. Subhanallah. So, so one thing we know is that the the city was then, you know, uh, given to the, the the Muslims conquered it. Uh, then there's the Umri Treaty, which you're not really going to co- uh, cover too much in this uh, section, but the there was like a treaty between uh, Umar and, uh, well, and and the, and the Christians yeah it is important actually even like you said briefly because when they look, we look at the deals that are being hatched today where muslims are finding it difficult to go and pray in al-aqsa and they do have like a second class status this was a time where and we see it happen again many times in in history where the muslims when they were in control of al-aqsa they were in control of um, the, the, this sanctuary and Palestine, then they allowed Christians and Jews to be able to practice their religion freely, come and practice on these lands freely and not be oppressed. And we see this. And whereas when we we see that these lands are being occupied by the occupation now, that's that's not the case. And they're not like you know the Crusades and things like that later on. So to be fair. It's really important to highlight that treaty. It's true, but with, with the with the Umri treaty, one of the uh, the points of it 
uh, which, like I said, it's, the reason why I don't want to bring it up is because it requires maybe half a podcast itself. Mm. Because, you know... It's uh, easily explained. Pe- it's the fact that the Jews were excluded from Jerusalem. That's right. And you know who asked for that? The, the patriarch. The Christians. Yeah, that's right. Mm. The Christians. It's easily explained. It that's was the right. Christians, mm. right? Yeah, At the right. end of the day, it was, it's that simple. Yeah. But you know what was really interesting about the, that tr- treaty for me? I hadn't, there was one point that I didn't realize. When Umar signed it, he said, this is a covenant from Allah, by Allah. His responsibility, it's resp- uh, responsibility falls on the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the 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 believers and the Khalifs. Are you to say that this is a covenant by Allah subhanahu wa taala on this land? So it's not uh, just. It's not by anyone. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And, and to be honest with you, uh, especially the fact that uh, the issue to do with the, the the Jews, even though the Christians had requested for the Jews to be, not be allowed in, in within Al Quds, okay. But what we have to understand is that the fact that Umar anhu he agreed to this and the companions also uh, agreed to it, what you got to understand is normally in Islam, you know, um, maybe in only in certain places can you um, stop people from residing in a certain area. Mm. So the fact, that, uh, uh, the fact that this was in line with Islam, otherwise... The uh, the Khalifa Umar, uh, Umar ibn Khattab He would have refused this He would have said You're not allowed to do this mm-hmm. The fact that he agreed to this The fact that the companions agreed to this This became an ijma mm-hmm. Okay That they were not allowed To reside in that area Today When we speak to many people They don't see the issue of Palestine Or Al-Quds They don't really see it As an issue That The way the Sahaba Understood mm-hmm. You know you were talking about The Sahaba were eager to Take that land. They don't see it that way. Why? Because what we see is that over the years, this conflict has been transformed from an Islamic issue to an Arab issue, to a Palestinian issue, to a West Bank issue, to a a, a Gaza issue, uh, a Fatah issue, a Hamas issue. And now then it's a humanitarian issue. Okay. Now it's to do with like justice, like you know, uh, like the, the whole world wants justice for the people there, and then it's talking, then then it's going to become into an issue which is to do with nationalism. I we need these people need their own homeland, they need their own flags, and they need their own constitution, etc. So what we see is that over the years, what's been happening is that Muslims, I would say, have lost that real connection, real that real understanding, the real appreciation of that land. And that's why today a lot of people, when they think think about uh, Palestine, when you think about Palestine today, one of the first things you think about, shall I tell you what it is? You don't think about Masjid Al-Aqsa. You think about that flag, what they call the Palestinian flag, that people wear. Mm -hmm. But has anyone ever thought, where did this flag come from? from Mm -hmm. Who, Who designed this flag? Right? Who designed this flag? So that's why I think it's very important. That's why we're doing this topic is because what we're trying to explain to Muslims is that this issue isn't a Palestinian issue. No. It's not an issue of apartheid. The issue here is, as for Muslims, is our connection to that place. I think a lot of people see it as similar to the oppression that Muslim lands are, are going through. So they might see what situation is happening in Iraq, what a situation is happening in Syria, what situation has happened or is still happening in Afghanistan. So they see Muslim countries suffering from oppression, be it from external, internal division. They see all of these things and they probably look at Palestine and go, similar is happening there. They look at Kashmir and, you know, we see there's similar yeah, there. Good point. So what ends up happening is because we see all of this oppression all over the world, in especially in Muslim countries, that it's quite natural then to say, that's a, pro- that's a problem. What can I really do about it? And just put Palestine, put Al-Quds in the same bracket as all of those without going through, like we said, to, towards the beginning of the podcast, the significance. That's not to say other Muslim lands aren't important, but to say that this land had a status which was far, far greater. And I think when, as, as an ummah, when we don't look at that in that same way, and we not even yearn for the fact that we need to solve this problem as a priority, then I think we start to get a bit fatalistic and start to say, like, maybe we can't do anything. And, and, and then when other solutions are given to us and we don't see an Islamic solution presented, we, you know, we, we just go for those instead. Yeah. I think that's part of the issue and not finding the importance of that land. And also, I think, um, 
just to add to that Rash and this important point that you know if we see it as a Palestinian issue mm. the reality is is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has blessed the, the, the people of, uh, of Quds mm. because I'm telling you the, what they go through and the fact that the, the Israelis have been offering them compensation mm. For, mm. for so long but they've kept their keys for their properties which obviously their villages don't exist anymore mm, exactly. because one thing I just want to quickly mention at this stage is that when we're talking about Palestine we're not just now just referring to Jerusalem we're talking about the whole of Palestine mm. the whole of Palestine is Muslim land yeah. okay but the point I'm trying to make is that we need to subhanallah you know Allah's blessed the, the people of that land right but the issue isn't a Palestinian issue what, what, I mean, what do I mean by this if tomorrow the Palestinian people accepted a two-state solution if they accepted that the Al-Quds could be an international zone mm-hmm. where it doesn't belong to anyone where foreign troops will be there to make sure you know no one side can take it if they accept the fact that you know okay we'll have a we'll have a East Jerusalem as our capital you have the if they accept that if we think it's a Palestinian issue that means we'll say well if the Palestinians are happy with it so that's fine mm. But is it that it's not the case? If all the Palestinians accepted this as Muslims, we would still reject this. Absolutely. And you know, the way Muslims should see it is, if a non-Muslim came into the compound of the Haram, you know, at the end of the day, if you see a non-Muslim there, he'd be like an alien. What on earth are you doing here? You don't belong here. Go away. Just like these horrible humans that turn up and kick people out of the mosque, they dance in the mosque. They're making a point that we can do this. And the thing is, first we have to reconnect to our identity, what it means to be a Muslim, what it means to Al Quds means to us, right? And the other thing, the reason why I mentioned that General Allenby point that he made a point that we're doing this, that you know Trump has said that it's undivided. It's not Muslims making this decision. There's rumors that Jared Kushner didn't even cons- consult when, when they were doing the deal of the century. He didn't consult the, consult the Palestinian sides. This is our identity. This is who we are. That's our land. It's for us to make that difference. You know, at the end of the day, Anwar Sadat, what did he say? He said, when, when, you know, when you mentioned the Egyptians, he was the leader of Egypt. He said, um, Russia can give us weapons, but America can give us solutions. Wrong. What he should have said is, both of them can give us weapons. Allah gives us solutions. And there is only one solution, that is Muslim land. Exactly. Wallahi, you know, at the end of the day, think about this harbour. When they, when they didn't have sandals, they didn't have siege craft. They had iman though. And that's what we have. Mm, subhanAllah. And you know, also what we see is that, you know, the arrogance, the arrogance of the occupiers. Yeah. We see that this has been emboldened. We see that over the years. You know, now, maybe at one stage, they may have felt like there's some conventional armies that are surrounding us. Through the Arab Spring, through the American plans, what we see is that these countries have been devastated now, right? Which to them, to the, to the Israelis feels like they can do what they what if they want. So for example, they take they've they've now Americans have said yeah Golan Heights is now part of uh, part of uh, Israel. Okay. Now the thing is is that people can go on and say well look this is illegal against international law. But the reality is is I just think about this. Who was in the Golan Heights? UN soldiers. Mm. And if you think about it, when we look to UN for solutions, those soldiers. They were really there to make sure the Muslims don't take that land. Exactly. And the fact that they've now announced it, they're not going to do anything. But you know, I want to just mention that that's why, you know, what we see is that, like you mentioned, daily now, mm. the humiliation. You know, the second intifada, you know how the second intifada started? The second intifada started when Ariel Sharon, mm. he stepped foot, he stepped foot on the Temple Mount. Yeah. You know, until I didn't understand that all of that was al Aqsa. I thought, okay, well, he didn't go to the mosque. But no, no, he stepped on the temple. Line. Subhanallah, today they are raving in the mosque. Yes. They are raving, waving their flags. They are having a party in their mosques. They decide who comes in, who goes out. This is, this is the humiliation that the Muslims are feeling. But this is a humiliation, not on the Palestinians. This is a humiliation on the Ummah. Mm. Because that land doesn't belong just to Palestinians. It belongs to the entire Ummah. Yes. And that's why, you know, when we understand what we spoke about. And this is why, you know, we first of all linked uh, the issue of Al-Quds to our, to our Iman, to our Aqeelah, to Islam. Once we understand it in this way, and I hope that, you know, for our listeners and our viewers that we've made it clear 
that what significance this place has. Now when you see this place in this, this way, and you see what's happening there today, and you see the deal of the century, and subhanAllah, an important point, the deal of the century, and the key point to make is that, you know, in the past, other presidents have had their solutions hmm. for the area. And you might remember when Trump came into power, from the very first day, he started saying, I've got a fantastic deal for the mid-Palestinian issue, Israeli issue. It was called the deal of the century, but I'm going to reveal it later. Hmm. But you know, this is the only deal that in fact has already been implemented. Yeah. You know, he announced it not long ago. This has been, the actual plan has been implemented since the guy came into power. Do Muslims even understand this? So Muslims are waiting for this. Okay, let's see what his, what this plan is going to be. What are you talking about? Look on the ground. Mm. Already they've recognized uh, Jerusalem as an undivided uh, capital of Israel. Golan Heights is gone. You see the settlements. Now they're going to recognize that these settlements are part of uh, Israel proper. Mm. Okay? This is happening. And if us Muslims don't wake up, and I'll tell you another important point as well, is, you know when the crusaders, when they were occupying uh, uh, Al-Quds, who liberated Al-Quds? Was it the people of Palestine? No, it wasn't. Salahuddin was Kurdish. He was from outside Salahuddin al He came from external. Why? Yeah. Because the people that are occupied, you cannot expect them to remove themselves of the occupation because if they had the means, they wouldn't be occupied in the first place. Right? But as Muslims, as long as we see that this issue is going to be sorted out by charity, this issue is going to be sorted out by the UN, or Hamas is going to do it, as long as we believe this, and the continuation of the excavation under the, you know, the, you know they're doing a lot of work, because from their ideology, they want to rebuild Solomon's temple. Yes. And the reality is, if the Muslims today are not doing anything about this, you know, if tomorrow... The building, what we think of Al-Aqsa Masjid was destroyed. I'm telling you, and it, you know, it really hurts me to say this. I still don't think there'll be, I think there'll be demonstrations. There'll be riots in Muslim lands. We'll burn our own properties, burn mm. our own cars. Maybe a few Muslims will die in the riots. But in the grand scheme of things, people won't do anything. They'll look to international law. How can they do this? You know, it's interesting that you say a humanitarian issue, this, that, you know, at the end of the day, right, humanitarian issues have humanitarian solutions. National issues have national solutions. Islamic issues have Islamic solutions. And that's the first step we should take. Mm -hmm. Reconnect with our history and reconnect with what our solutions are. Because to be honest, when we, in, our, in our masjids, are our imams given the Islamic solution or the solution that's presented by people who have already signed off Jerusalem as being the capital? That's the one horrible memory I have, that when he signed it off, who, who, I don't know, who, who, who gave him that right? Who Subhan gave him that right? Subhan He's already signed it off. Here you go. It's done. Subhanallah. No, that's, that's, and uh, what do you guys, uh, what, uh, what, what do you want to say about the, those people who look, uh, look to the rulers of, the, of, the, of those areas to uh, liberate that land? May Allah help you. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> but these are rulers that who already sold their souls mm. to get into those positions. They have to adhere. Look at what the Saudis have said that there are some good in uh, Trump's plan. I can't remember the exact wording. So that's what he said. Yeah. There is some good, so we can work with this. So we can negotiate on it. So what you're going to do is you're going to forget about the blood of the army of Umar radiallahu the blood of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You're going to forget that covenant that Umar radiallahu taala an had. Subhanallah. You know, these aren't normal people. These are the best generation of the, after the prophets. After the prophets uh, uh, come, they'll be the Sahaba on the Day of Judgment. And, actually, and they're going to renege on that. How, there's nobody greater. Wallahi, may the curse of Allah be on these people. So they are the worst of people. And you know, just to add to that, that, that point is that that comment was made in reference to recognizing Israel. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That we will recognize them. There's some good in this deal. Let's work on it. And then we'll recognize that. And what does recognize mean? It basically means to give that to give that land away. It means to give quds away. And subhanAllah, that's why it is is for, for any Muslims out there who are looking to the solutions mm. for these people to come to the aid. In reality, you know, the leaders of that land, of the Muslim lands that surround that area, they are they are the actual the defenders of Israel. Yes. They are the true defenders of Israel. Because, you know, there is sentiment in, in the Ummah. There is sentiment in the Ummah. I'm telling you something now. People of Egypt, I remember years ago, they were saying, open the borders. Mm. 
Open the borders. We'll go there because look, you got to understand. And Rash mentioned this on uh, our the, when we did a podcast on the deal of the century, is that you know a, a country where it's so small, hmm. right? So small with less population. In reality, it can't survive, right? If the people of Israel, I remember Muslim said to me a long time. If the people of uh, no, if the people of Egypt, if they were to spit towards Israel. Yeah. They would drown the people. <laughs> I am talking purely on a population point yeah. of view, right? Yeah. So the people want to do this. What we have to understand is that these leaders were put there from day one, and they're still there, and they're there to make sure that this land is sold. And in the old days, they did it undercover. Mm-hmm. Now they're doing it, doing it more openly. So when Muslims think about the deal of the century, they think about Trump's deal. Subhanallah, only a few days ago I was reading about they, they're going to have this new train station that's going to that's going to uh, arrive right under the uh, Beit al Maqdis, mm. right? And it's going to be called Trump Station. Yeah, it's going to be Trump. This is something which really, as Muslims and our our viewers and our listeners, you know, we really want you to really appreciate that what we're doing here. And you know, I can't put it better than what Brother Ishti said that this is the land where our beloved messenger, who we love. More than anyone Other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala This is the land Where he led the Anbiya in Salah mm-hmm. This is the land That the Sahaba They fought over This is the land That Umar radiallahu anhu The, the man who, The great man Who is buried Besides our beloved messenger Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He made that deal Who the hell am I And who the hell are you And who the hell is Trump Or any of the Muslim rulers Who the hell do they think they are That they think They can rip up That treaty That Umar radiallahu anhu made Subhanallah, this is something which we all should think about. And hopefully in this podcast, we want, really wanted to get this across. Mm-hmm. You know, w- the issue is we, are, we become fatalistic. And you know, previously, previous generations looked at the prophecies mm-hmm. that the Prophet ﷺ brought, and that would give them motivation. So when they hear about the, uh, you know, that the land of Constantinople mm-hmm. will open to the Muslims, when the time, you know, the, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu during the Battle of the Trench when he we hit the rock yeah. and it was told that, you know, um, the Sana will be open to you and, you know, you'll take over the Romans and the Persians. Those were motivating factors for the Muslims. The Muslims that even after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu the Muslims continued because they were motivated by those prophecies. There are prophecies that continue to tell us that in the future, the, the capital of Islam will be Jerusalem. The capital of Islam will be there. Al-Aqsa will be under the Muslims. But where is the motivation today for us to say, we want to be amongst those Muslims who work for that to be under Muslim rule once again? Instead, like you said, we're looking at these solutions that are being presented to us that are, like Ishti said, they might be solutions to some minor humanitarian issues, but they're not solutions to occupation and this is where we like you said we need to reconnect and we need to look at these prophecies and we need to be motivated by them and we need to work towards a, an actual solution not these solutions that are, are being sold to us subhanallah uh, any final points uh but i think rush somebody up beautifully there but mashallah yeah okay so subhanallah if there's nothing else to add let's uh, bring this podcast to to a close um the few for the final uh, thoughts from myself really is as muslims uh, we should really this should just be a motivation for you to just go and check out go and do your history because uh, read your history because as Ishti said we need to connect back with the Islam we need to connect back with our history and once we do this we will really understand what the significance of Al-Quds is to Muslims and I hope we've we've done some of that you know it, it's what would they call it a scratch on the surface yeah. but inshallah hopefully this can instill the motivation in you to do this and in regards to solutions we haven't got time to speak about solutions. But one thing I will say is that Nuruddin Zangi Rahimahullah, Salahuddin Alayubi Rahimahullah, these great people didn't do charity runs. They didn't cycle for Palestine. They didn't do these things. They didn't look to the crusaders and ask them to give them part of, uh, of Jerusalem as, as their capital. The solutions that they understood was that to take this land back, it has to be taken back by force. It has to be taken by a jihad fi sabilillah. This is a bigger issue, it's a bigger discussion. 
and how we can do this and obviously it's not something for now but when we think about solutions our solutions like she said the solutions don't come from the Russians they don't come from the Americans they come from the Quran and the Sunnah and we should understand this so inshallah we'll end this podcast here if you can uh, go and check out our material on Twitter YouTube podcast uh, Facebook, Facebook <laughs> Telegram Instagram Instagram I need to write this down because I forget this every single time <laughs> but we're on loads of platforms subscribe share follow us inshallah ta'ala. we can't really do this without first and foremost from the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also by the assistance from you guys and in fact we're doing this for you guys uh, mainly you know to get this awareness out so inshallah ta'ala, end the podcast on that note assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh thanks for watching that video for more exclusive videos please like share and subscribe to our channel Don't forget you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.